may shamelessly show a few of my past characters from my acting career during the presentation, so I apologize for that right now. So I'm not here to change your practice, just perhaps make life a little bit easier. Um, there's going to, there's, because of the concepts I've cho chosen uh, throughout the day today with our speakers, there's going to be some peat and repeat uh, concepts coming at you, and that's because they're vitally important, and I see mistakes being made on a daily basis at many institutions. Uh, so I think that I'm trying to uh, give you a hand in, and assist you uh, in your practices by giving, offering this information along with my colleagues today. We saw the explosion of active ECMO centers uh, really around the, uh, I guess around 2005 or so, uh, where we uh, just exploded off the map there up to around uh, what we have almost 450, 450 uh, centers in the world right now. Uh, with the adult respiratory cases, I believe 2005 was a monumental air, uh, year. Why is that? Well, the H1N1, you know, and all of a sudden we were showing uh, that ECMO was serving a purpose for the survival of these patients. And uh, with uh, Dr. Bartlett's guidance and Dr. Conrad, Dr. Scott, uh, we were able to uh, then discover that the lung had uh, recovering capabilities. It just took much more time. So uh, we were really uh, on pins and needles thinking the, the H1N1 was gonna come hard at us because of the European uh, experience. Luckily, the vaccine was developed. We still had many cases in the US, but not to the degree that we thought we were gonna have because we didn't have enough centers, enough beds to put people on ECMO for H1N1, but uh, because of that experience with the success of ECMO on pulmonary patients, uh, then we, uh, the explosion took off. And at the same time, I think there was an acceptance of ECMO by not only the pulmonologists and the intensivists, which is still continuing, but also the cardiac surgeons at the same time. So the explosion also occurred within the cardiac cases um, uh, uh, in, our in our practices. And uh, boy, when we were going in 1983, 84, and that was even after Bartlett was messing around with ECMO, uh, there were about three centers, three or four centers in the, in the U.S. and, you know, official centers. We were getting together in a little room uh, talking about our experiences, and, and just the explosion has been dramatic across the world. So it's so cool to have uh, so many centers and watch this evolution develop. So I may be preaching to the choir here, I realize that, but uh, some of these, again, some of these concepts um, uh, I see on a daily basis that are misunderstood and I wanna increase, uh, I wanna increase the knowledge of that, plus I wanted to show my first shameless promotion of my acting experience. So as far as staffing models, um, a lot of times we're still in staffing models where we have the primary care uh, nurse, uh, the respiratory therapist on the right there, and then a perfusionist, respiratory therapist, or nurse in the center doing ECMO. So that's basically the traditional model uh, that many of the centers still provide in, in their care. Uh, we know that staffing is an issue. Um, so in the two-person uh, care provider, in some centers, we have a uh, primary care nurse that's very well trained in ECMO as well, or a respiratory therapist that's very well trained in ECMO. And then um, in, in a better hybrid model, I think, is where we have a respiratory therapist or perfusionist or nurses uh, watching uh, the ECMO patients with a perfusionist uh, that knows a lot, uh, somewhat about ECMO kind of coming by and checking out things uh, and making sure things are going well and somebody always on call for uh, responses in case of accidents. Um, in some centers then, they've even gone to an open unit uh, where they have uh, no separate rooms unless there's isolation. Uh, involved, and we have uh, many ECMO patients right there in one room and a kind of a central center where you have a few nurses, maybe a perfusionist and assistants, and you're kind of watching the whole group of ECMO patients right there. So it's a way in a big volume center to be able to, uh, to uh, staff these kind of uh, patients for the length of time, especially for the length of time that they're on, especially in adult patients. And of course, you know, you'll have that perfusionist still coming by, in my opinion, that's an important thing if they know what they're doing. So perfusionists um, should always stay involved in their ECMO program. I've said that from day one. Uh, they should uh, at least perform as a uh, perfusionist ECMO specialist in the circuit setup, priming, and setup, um, although some centers do without it, fine. They should participate in shifts, if possible, time permitting. 
and they should definitely be consultants to the ECMO programs in equipment selection, troubleshooting, and quality improvement. And of course, teaching with the ECMO centers offer your services in teaching and didactic. Just make sure you're teaching the right things. So the usual patient advocate perfusionist comes, uh, if they're not at bedside, they're usually coming around on a pass-by or if they're called uh, for help, but they usually come on a pass-by and, uh, uh, or they may get called. They come by and they say, oh, what's the pump flow? What's, uh, what's the RPMs? You know, good. Uh, blood gases, how's the patient blood gases? How's the oxygen air? Great. Uh, anticoagulation, any clots? You see any clots in the oxygen air? No, yeah, no, well, let's not worry about it right now. Uh, venous saturations, we ask about that. And then we ask, oh, do you need supplies? Because often we're supplying the ECMO programs. And are we weaning yet? Because, uh, you know, we've been on for a couple of weeks now. Uh, why aren't we weaning? Are we weaning? You know, whatever. But I think more pertinent information, if you really get involved with your uh, ECMO programs, would be uh, obviously look at blood gas changes and where the sampling is being done, uh, the venous saturation plus the pulse oximetry, the hematic crit, the, uh, look at x-rays from day to day and see if there's improvement or deterioration. We'll give you an idea of if, we're, if the patient's ready to be weaned or not, or if we're doing the proper strategy uh, to show uh, that we, to help get that patient off ECMO sooner. And then, of course, volume status is so important. So look at your diuresis. Look at your CRT removal. If the patient's eight liters over, but we have intravascular volume enough, let's, let's watch volume status. You know, I've, I've been on shifts where we took three liters off and then uh, on a day shift, and then at the night shift, somebody gave that volume right back again for reasons we'll go into in a second. So kind of get an idea where volume status is, and if it's really needed uh, uh, in the intravascular system to maintain whatever flow you're trying to achieve. Uh, and then what's the ventilator management? I think we have to become better uh, at ventilator management with ECMO. There's plenty of uh, new, uh, new uh, procedures out there, new uh, 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 directions that we're going. We're going to see Dr. Scott later on give us a great lecture on that, as well as Dr. Conrad. Uh, and then look at medication changes. What, what are we on now? And, uh, you know, what, what's going on? Are we doing Esmolol or are we doing, uh, uh, you know, you know, what, what kind of medication changes? Uh, what are the bleeding amounts? Are we still bleeding as heavily as we were? Are we bleeding from the chest tubes? If we're not all of a sudden abruptly bleeding, bleeding from the chest tubes, are we creating kind of a, um, uh, a, a tamponade type in, in a cardiac situation? Uh, anticoagulation issues, you know, whether we're using heparin, whether it's effective, whether there's enough AT3, whether we switch to thrombin inhibitors. And then uh, what is the plan or strategy? You know, find out what the plan or strategy. Be involved in your ECMO program. What, where are we going with this? And uh, of course, it's, if there's family issues, you know, sometimes you can get involved with that as well uh, and speak with them if uh, the uh, hospital allows that within their protocols. But the main thing I think that we should do as perfusionists in the pass by, or if we're uh, just being involved from a peripheral uh, type of uh, intervention, is attend the rounds. It is so important, I think. As, clear, clear, as clinicians to attend the rounds, whether they're in the morning or the morning in the afternoon, if you can get somebody there, and often the hospitals that do it right, have a major rounding of all the specialties involved in that patient. Uh, so it could be uh, hematologists, it could be intensivists, surgeons, uh, they do it well. They definitely look at the clinician, you definitely have a say-so as a perfusionist, attend the rounds. It's very important to see where things are going, and you can often give insight into the care of that patient patient and possibly improvements. Shameless, shameless, terrible pirate. Okay, so we know in veno arterial uh, that we do uh, central cannulation. Uh, it's probably the most effective and efficient way of doing things, but it does involve the opening the chest. Uh, so no big deal with that, but it does offer the antigrade flow so that the blood is going in the direction uh, that the heart, the left ventricle is pumping out. And then we have peripheral VA ECMO, of course, where we have, is my laser on the front button? Oh, well, oh, there it is, sort of. Okay. Um, oh, there's a button right there. Okay, so uh, in peripheral VA ECMO, obviously, and I think people have uh, learned this uh, over a period of time, possibly by uh, 
by accident, but in, if we're fem fem cannulated and we have lungs that are not working properly, anything coming from the left ventricle can be very dark blood. Uh, some people have referred to this as a Harlequin syndrome. So the left ventricle is pumping this blood, which is unfortunately getting to the head through the innominate. And uh, whoops, 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 whoops. Itchy trigger finger, huh? Okay, it's really close to the screen. Okay. So, uh, so we have to watch that we're, you know, have, have, don't have a lower uh, beautiful pink body from the arterial cannula and this ECMO circuit and a anoxic uh, upper body because of what's coming from the left ventricle. So we often measure uh, these radio pressures or pulse oxes on the right side of the body to give an idea what is the head seeing, what is the left ventricle seeing, what are the coronary arteries seeing. So we're not going to touch base on that heavily due to time today, but it's definitely something we need to be aware of. And uh, so it's important to know where we're actually pulling blood from, from sampling, or where we're putting pulse oximetry uh, on, on the, uh, which side of the body to know that we're not going to save the lower part but lose the upper. So in VV ECMO, uh, which is what we're going to concentrate a little bit more on today, we have the dual site uh, cannulation, uh, like Dr. Harper had mentioned earlier, where we're uh, pulling from the lower uh, body or maybe with a long cannula, and we're putting oxygenated blood back in through the jugular into the right, uh, right side of the heart, which will then go through the lungs. And of course, we have the dual lumen, uh, the dual lumen single cannula, which many people actually poo-poo uh, because of experience, and they have problems with placement, but it actually works pretty well. And in my opinion, I think it does work better uh, for ambulation uh, when you get to that point. So I think there's a learning curve with the VV, so I wouldn't give up on it too quickly. I'm not going to say which company might be better, but certainly they've made improvements to cut down recirculation in the VV cannula. So uh, it's still uh, my um, uh, first um, first uh, choice if we're having if I know that patient's going to be ambulatory eventually. Okay, so in an ARGE type situation, we had a normal lung on the left side, uh, and then all of a sudden with an ARGE type pattern, for whatever reason, it's a fairly general term, we get opacification on the x-ray with pulmonary edema, fulminant pulmonary edema. Uh, so we have a decision to put a patient on ECMO for pulmonary compromise. Um, we then calculate to flows. What do, we get, what do we need to get, what flows do we need so we know we can pick up cannula size? Well, that's a really, really good question, often misunderstood. If you're trying to get flows that are based, BSA based at two index, you're, for VV ECMO, you're incorrectly calculating. And uh, Dr. Conrad is going to go get into that heavily, but you probably only need about two thirds of the cardiac output whatever that is, to be able to deliver an, uh, enough oxygen to meet the patient's demand. And this is extremely important not to try to shoot for uh, a, BS, uh, a cardiac index like we do with bypass of 1.82022. It's not the same animal. So we do go ahead and change, uh, look at uh, the selection. What's the uh, uh, vessel size? Is it, uh, um, are we then uh, doing a two-site or a one-site cannulation? And uh, what's the actual calculated flows? Again, not looking, not thinking VA ECMO, but VV ECMO, a different animal. And then we initiate ECMO to attempt uh, achieving whatever flow that is. So we have continuous monitoring that's going on. Uh, at that time. Now, this is the smorgasbord of monitoring. If I can do blood gases, uh, of course, my blood pressures, my pulse oximetry, my venous saturations, and also looking at cardiac output, like with this Edwards um, uh, flow track, um, that's really the smorgasbord that'll give me uh, ideas of how my patients do it, not to mention uh, measurements of electrolytes and lactate levels. So we get on ECMO, where oxygenator FiO2 is 100%. This is VV ECMO again. We put the patient on resting settings. I'm just going to mention these, but Dr. Scott again is going to go into why these are now the more acceptable uh, settings while on VV ECMO, 30% FiO2, 10 of rate, and 10 of PEEP. We stabilize, and then we begin to tweak the oxygenator setting based on gases like the sweep gas based on parameters, not so much in the FiO2 region at that point. So we, here's the patient that we have on uh, ECMO. We got up to four liters per minute. You can see we have a... Uh, 4.7 cardiac output. Now these are, you know, these, these tend to move around, but you know, they trend pretty well. We have about five liters per minute cardiac output. We have an 83% uh, pulse ox, and we have a 72% venous saturation with a PO2 of 55. 
So the clinician at this point feels that, you know, especially the clinician that are more, that are more used to VA ECMO or cardiac pulmonary bypass, they feel that ECMO is not delivering adequate oxygen with those low, relatively low numbers. So we increase the VV flow by turning up the RPMs. We then eventually get venal ves uh, venous vessel collapse onto the drainage cannula with intermittent chugging. Uh, so we make sure that the venous cannula placement is not the problem. And then what do we do? Well, we assume hypovolemia is now considered, so the specialist infuses copious amounts of volume to try to uh, increase the intravascular volume to increase flow. We stop the chugging, and perhaps now we can turn up flow to increase PO2 or pulse oximetry readings. Hey, man, that sounds cool. Except this is what happens then often, is our ECMO flow does go up to 4.5 liters per minute, but then all of a sudden we're reading a cardiac output of around 10 liters per minute. So we've pipe basically doubled the cardiac output. Is that bad or good? It sounds like good, but on VV ECMO it's not. We then start seeing pulse oxes that drop from 83 to 67 percent, and venous sats that are actually dropping from the 70 area to down to 54 percent. And then our PO2s have dropped, dropped from 55 down to 38. Hey, but we went up on flow. And also at the same time, we're going to look at the x-rays that were yesterday that seemed to be clearing or the shift before, and all of a sudden the next morning with that copious amount of volume, we're back to pulmonary edema again. And no kidding, the gases are getting worse on VV ECMO. So the decision that more ECMO flow was needed to meet metabolic demand uh, may have been incorrect. The, the decision causes the ECMO specialist to increase pump console RPMs, uh, decision, uh, the decision provides higher flow achieved with clinicians still not satisfied with the adequacy of perfusion because we get fixated on the pulse ox and the patient arterial PO2. So the, the decision again at that time is to increase flow. Well, chugging occurs or pump limit pressures, if you're using a centrifugal pump, goes to above 100. We'd like to stay below that if possible. Uh, so we prevent hemolysis and other issues that it can occur. Uh, we dis and then the decision to infuse even more volume. Well, that does increase the CVP. Again, that does increase the venous capacitance. And again, that does increase native cardiac output. And, um, it, 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 and then, we're, then they say, well, uh, the pulmonologists come in and say, well, we better go ahead and increase our ventilator settings beyond what I showed before, the suggested rest levels, which again, Dr. Scott will get into. And then at the worst point, then the surgeons come in and say, oh, we need to put another cannula in. We just can't get a high enough flow because the pulse oxes are low again, the PO2s are low again. So now we've got to put another drainage cannula in so we can get more flow. So uh, yikes. Um, so as my... A uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Scott, uh, tells me, uh, my colleague being that we work together within Perfusion.com teaching ECMO, uh, 1 plus 1 equals 12. So the more we start doing manipulations that are incorrect with the ECMO, the more problems we start occurring down line, like that extra cannula uh, that placement. So we had the decision maker looked at other it had the decision maker looked at other parameters such as venous PO2s, venous SATs, base deficits, lactate levels as well. Perhaps none of these decisions would have been implemented. So just again, lactate is one of the substances produced by the cells uh, as the body turns food into energy. Depending on the pH, it's sometimes present in the form of lactic acid. However, with a neutral pH maintained by the body, most of it will be present in the blood in the form of lactate. It's the end product of anaerobic muscle metabolism in increasing the acidity of the tissue to the point where function is sacrificed. So our normal ranges generally will see 0.5 to 1 millimole per liter. In a critically ill patients, uh, generally we'll see with, uh, they'll go up to 2 millimoles per liter. Uh, but oftentimes we'll see them greater than 6, 8, 10 millimoles per liter uh, lactic acid levels, uh, especially before we go on ECMO. But we must look for the trending of the lactate levels once we establish ECMO to see if they're not going up further or they're actually washing out and coming down down, which means, hey, we may be meet, meeting metabolic demand at that point. So do we really need those higher flows that we were trying to achieve because the pulse ox was 55 or the um, uh, 83 and the PO2 was 55? Uh, the answer is no. And Dr. Bartlett's going to show some uh, mathematical formulas later on this afternoon to show this kind of thing. Plus, he has a surprise for us, too, which is really cool. Um, so we also look at the, how's the lung compliance going uh, on the ventilators? You know, oftentimes these patients with ours are showing us lung uh, compliancy of maybe, you know, 68, 86, uh, 78 uh, uh, cc volume with, on the low settings. And uh, we're, we're kind of, are we really concerned about that? The answer is really no, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to rest the lung. That is the best way to heal the lung is to rest it. And it could be days, weeks, 
months. And again, Dr. Scott will be getting into that. But oftentimes when people don't see the compliancy improving after one week, two weeks, two and a half weeks, three weeks, um, they, they kind of freak out. And I'll tell you right now, ECMO generally can take three, four weeks or more in the adult patients, um, depending on age, uh, depending on many factors, whether they're septic. So just be patient with this because eventually when you start clearing and doing proper volume status, these numbers will all of a sudden dramatically take off in the 200, 300, 400 range uh, while you're on the rest settings. So the weaning differences, and I'm, sh I'm telling this because I see the mistakes. Obviously on VA ECMO, I don't have to tell too many people here. We maintain the FiO2 uh, for 100% saturated blood from the ECMO circuit. We set reasonable ventilator settings on VA ECMO. We decrease the ECMO flow incremental, incrementally, altering the uh, gas to blood flow ratio for desired levels. And we assess heart function then through either a TEE, surface echo, or looking at flow track. Um, and we, of course, we're looking at venous saturations, arterial PO2s, how well is the heart and the lungs functioning. VV ECMO, oh, and, and lactate levels. VV ECMO, we maintain the same circuit flow, basically. Again, it's a two-thirds, possibly, of the total cardiac output that may have been calculated. We set reasonable ventilator settings. We decrease the FiO2 incrementally, eventually to 21 or 30 percent, as the patient shows that his lungs are improving. So I'll start at 100 percent, and we're weaning by weaning the FiO2 and possibly the sweep slightly, but definitely the FiO2. So as we assess pulmonary function with pulse oximetry, venous saturation, arterial blood gases, and of course compliancy, and we're looking at lactate levels. So recently I was at a center and they were on VA ECMO and they were a little confused and they were decreasing the FiO2 incrementally uh, on the VA ECMO. So uh, basically they were telling me then when I got there that hey, the patient's doing well at 80% FiO2, but when we get down to 70% FiO2, he craps out. Sorry, craps out. Well, no kidding, because all of a sudden in VV, VA ECMO, you're turning the FiO2 down, now you're shunning venous blood from the venous system right into the arterial system. So you don't wean FiO2 in VA ECMO. In VV ECMO, we do. The only time you set FiO2, obviously, in VA ECMO is if you want to get that PO2 outlet around 150 to 400, which we deem uh, as a perfusion is a safe range for arterial blood gas. More shamelessness times two. Okay, so pneumothorax and hemothorax, uh, no big uh, thing to us, but we often uh, know that we have to put uh, chest tubes in for a pneumo or a hemothorax. Uh, we put the chest tube insertion in, uh, and possibly the one on the bottom might be for the um, hemothorax, one on top, or wherever the area of the pneumothorax might be. We, uh, uh, the complications that can occur uh, just in general are pain during the placement, uh, infection, obviously. Uh, bleeding uh, can be small amounts usually. Uh, this is not on ECMO at this point. This is just general complications that can occur. Or poor tube place, placement. And the tube can be too far inside, not far enough. Inside the pleural space, you know, you all have seen it. I don't have to tell you about that. But then we get the domino effect when we go ahead and put, uh, try to put chest tubes on patients that are on ECMO. And in one center I went to, they had put, I think, four or five chest tubes while they were on ECMO. Um, and this was uh, really turned into some major complications. So serious complications that can occur on ECMO by putting chest tubes in are acute injury to the lung, diaphragm, or stomach, bleeding, excessive bleeding into the uh, pleural space because if you nick the lung or, you know, the lung is already inflammatory, so it's already bleeding, but all of a sudden we're causing more bleeding, you can get into very excessive where you can't even keep up. And then all of a sudden, what are we doing? We're giving tons of blood uh, back to the patient to replace that, which puts them in a more inflammatory state, which then prolongs the ECMO uh, 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 run because the lungs then continue to be um, uh, edematous at that time due to the inflammatory reactions. Uh, then uh, we can also get collapsed lung during tube removal. Some people have tried to even remove it during ECMO, which is probably not a good thing. So, uh, or there can be dislodgement accidental. So what we're saying as ECMOlogists is consider not inserting chest tubes during early the phases of the ECMO run. We're resting the lung anyway. Just leave that pneumo or that hemothorax alone.
while you're on ECMO and anticoagulated uh, because the pneumo or the hemo may resolve itself, but we're not too worried about it because we're on rest settings. Only consider chest tube insertion on ECMO if at the appropriate time on ECMO, there's no resolve and alveolar recruitment is impeded. So this is, could be after uh, weeks or, or uh, months. We want to wean down, but we're, it's still impeding us from weaning further. Or the ECMO circuit, of course, is impeded. ECMO flow is impeded. Uh, and then we might have to go ahead and put a chest tube in. Otherwise, stay away from it because the risks outweigh the benefits. So the conclusions, perfusions should always stay intimately involved in their ECLS programs. We should take into account and interpret various physiological parameters correctly. And then weaning principles, VA, we wean blood, not oxygen or FiO2. And VV, we wean oxygen or FiO2, not necessarily blood flow. We can keep the same blood flow, turn the FiO2 or the gas off, be it'll be VV, it's not, uh, it's not uh, deleterious, plus it's um, because you're taking out in the venous and putting it back in, and uh, you're also preventing any clotting if you're in a low anticoagulation state by having higher flows. And then we maintain the low ventilator settings, uh, be patient, especially with the adult population, because weeks, if not months, for lungs to heal. And then consider not inserting chest tubes early on ECMO due to possible unrecoverable consequences. So with perfusion.com, uh, I just wanted to put a little plug for what I'm doing with them. We provide clinical services with ECMO, obviously, with experienced clinicians in ECMO. Uh, we have educational programs where we teach new ECMO programs or, or help with existing ECMO programs and teaching new clinicians. Uh, we consult for improvements in programs, which I love to do. And then we can also help with equipment, techniques, and problematic issues within the institutions that might want to uh, tap into our services. And with Dr. Scott and I, who go out to uh, the centers and teach, uh, um, we become a partnership with the medical facilities out there. So just because we go in and teach and then we leave, they can still call us at any time or we watch them grow as an institution. So it's pretty exciting for me to be in this teaching uh, aspect after so many years in an academic center uh, at Oxnard when I was there. So my tameless, uh, totally shameless conclusion is one should check out my IMDB site for past and future acting pro projects. That's my IMDB site. And then uh, I want to thank you. I'm reading the end of it, and that's all, folks. Thank you for your attention.